I'm resigning. To go where? Nowhere. I'm retiring. Congratulations, Diane. <laughs> Maya, how you doing? Good. Oh, oh, your first day as a lawyer. Follow me and try to keep up. Luca. Miss Lockhart. Hello. Sorry I'm late. Diane, I heard you retiring. It's terrible. You're going to lose your last case. <laughs> Look at you. Maya tells me what a great mentor you are. She's been rocking it at work. Doing my best, like you, Dad. Diane, are you hearing this? Arrested Henry Wendell on suspicion of running a multi-billion dollar Ponzi scheme. What about my... My retirement money. It's all gone. And we're down we go. They have a warrant. They're searching our apartment. This is a nightmare. Are you okay? Will I get my money back? Then don't ask me. What do you propose? Uh, that, that I not leave. Unfortunately, I, I don't think that works for us. I'm gonna sue you for every single cent! I'm talking about the most hated person in America. This was my life. It's gone. You have to stay sane. I had a friend. She went through the same thing. Said it was hell for a few months. Harden yourself. Ignore what people say. It's hard, but it ends. Eventually, everyone reveals himself. Thank you so much for being here. Congratulations on what I think is an incredible follow-up to what was already one of the greatest TV shows we ever had. It's, it's amazing that you were able to do it. It's amazing that we, uh, we stayed together, and it's amazing that these writers wanted to continue because I, I think the greatness of the show was predicated on its really smart writing and it's great ensemble awesome. acting, and, and that's what we have with this uh, spin-off. So. So what was the pitch to you for the, for the spinoff? How did they There was no real pitch. Um, I went, I agreed to do it simply because um, <clears throat> over the summer I'd been off, uh, actually in the spring, I got another offer to do uh, another network show, 22 episode show. And I said, well, can we, you know, talk about this possible spinoff because I'm going to have to make a big career decision here. And, and uh, they didn't really have much of an idea to pitch to me. I just wanted to remain with the Kings, with Robert and Michelle King, and with the crew and what we had created. And especially, I love this character so much. And it was just such a happy seven years. And now we've got great new actors, uh, you know. Incredible an, cast. Incredible um, ensemble cast. So yeah, it, I actually did not see a script when I agreed to do, it hadn't been written by a long shot. I just agreed to be with a group of people that I really believed in. Justin, you're, you're a New Yorker, aren't you? I am, yeah. I would imagine that you're a Good Wife fan, because if you're a New Yorker, you're Anyone a Good Wife. New York here? Anyone from New York? <laughs> uh, were you a fan of The Good Wife before taking, jumping onto the show? Uh, yeah, I, was a I watched the uh, first couple seasons, um, and I'm a, I was a big fan. You know, I, this is one of the greatest actresses. Oh, great. Come on. Even the, even her her false modesty aside, she is the greatest. And I, you know, when I I remember not to embarrass you, but you know, I would watch that show, and it's kind of like seeing the Avengers of actors. They have all of these amazing New York actors and actors that they bring in for guest spots. And uh, and I remember thinking, you know. Uh, Baranski is just one of the most interesting women I've ever seen. A character, uh, uh, Diane, is one of the most interesting characters I've ever seen uh, on uh, uh, certainly a network television show. So when I heard that, you know, that kind of this was an ensemble but centered around uh, the Diane character, it was like, yeah, absolutely. Well, thank you, baby. Christine, what do you love about playing Diane so much? There are so many um, r reasons that I, I love it, but I love I, I love that she's a woman of authority. I, I hate, you know, we're all tired of hearing about strong women, but she is indeed a strong, <laughs> strong woman. She's, um, what, what I like most about her is 
she keeps her balance, and so often we see women portrayed as imbalanced. I mean, if they're successful, they must be unhappy in their personal life, or if they don't have children, they're unhappy, or, you know, there's, there's always some psychic penalty that a woman has to pay for whoever she is, or some wound that can't be healed. I'm not saying Diana's perfect, but I love that she represents what a lot of women are like these days. They're well-educated, they're articulate, they're, they're put together, you know, they walk out of the house and they're, they're uh, stylish, they're, they command, you know, they have real presence. She's the head of her law firm. She can be in a room full of guys and hold her own and not even make an issue of the fact that she's the only woman in a room. I don't think enough, uh, there, there are enough women like that represented in film or television. I have felt that for seven years. I always thought, wow, am I lucky to play a woman like this? And there are so wim many women out there in the world like this, running institutions, running governments, running universities. We thought we would have. Should be we presidents. Came, yes, we came very close and she won the popular vote. I mean, let's face it, women are really very, you know, women are taken over. And I think the Diane character is so unique in her ability to shift her weight and keep her, you know, she has tremendous resiliency. She has a kind of moral integrity, or at least she fights to maintain it. And I think, you know, from the response that I've gotten from women who've approached me over the years, how grateful they are to see a Diane character. What a role model she's been to young women. I, I got a, a, a met a law professor who said, my young law students look to you as a role model. I mean, all this stuff, it, it matters. If you think you can contribute in some way, and I do think cult, uh, television has the power to move the culture forward in the way we think, because it, it's just so ubiquitous. We can change the way we think about a woman over 40 or 50 or 60. This, w this show really, is about women of all decades, and um, the she fact that she apologizes. No, she That's doesn't apologize. She doesn't apologize, and you don't expect her to apologize. No, and an issue isn't made of the fact that she's exactly. a certain age, or that she's a certain sex, or that you, she's she's she just, just a she is a human being, powerful, moving in the world, and I think. You know, I, I just am so happy to continue the character. And I think that's something that this season of the show follows through with as well from a different component in the sense that Diane goes to work for a predominantly black law firm. And whereas most shows would feature a predominantly white law firm with one African-American character in there, this is a predominantly African-American law firm with one or two white women working in it, which is completely a completely different just visual idea than we've ever seen on television. Which is insane in the first place that that's a new <laughs> idea on television. <laughs> I also love that, you know, we know Diane from the seven years, the, the woman in the, you know, beautifully dressed behind the gigantic desk with the cityscape in, you know, of Chicago in the background. Well, one third of the way into the pilot, she loses all her money. So her strength and her resiliency are really put to the test. I mean, she loses her money, she loses her reputation. Her she ideals has to are look, threatened at one point. Yes, she feels she's lost her friends. So many people don't want to associate with her because of her relationship to the um, family that was responsible for the Ponzi scheme. So you, you're seeing a woman just, her foundation is, you know, crumbles underneath her and she's trying to take the first steps towards a new life, which is was really the Alicia Florex story in um, The Good Wife. The first thing she had to do was go back to work. And, um, you know, it's showing a woman of strength and how she handles incredible adversity. Can we talk about the uh, first scene uh, of the pilot, the opening scene, which was one incredibly cathartic <laughs> to see? <laughs> For those who haven't seen it, it is. Do you want? Do you want to say what it is? Well, I, it should. We, I should just say that the pilot was shot just before, during the night of, and after the election. And the writers, when they wrote the the pilot, assumed we were going to have a female president. So that was in their mind. But when we had a surprisingly new president, they rewrote the first. <laughs> The first scene of the pilot is now Diane watching the inauguration. <laughs> and Robert King directed the first scene. You're going to love this. Um, 
And then he said, okay, you're sitting alone and you're, and you're stunned by what you're watching. And I said, believe me, I can play that. <laughs> and he said, okay, so you're, Christine, could you just open your mouth like you're stunned? I went, like that. And so we do a few takes. And he said, actually open your mouth just a, oh, just a little more, like really, really a, be stunned. Ah, yeah, ah, yeah. <laughs> and he said, okay, I know this is gonna sound like you're really doing high comedy, <laughs> but would you just really open your jaw as wide as you can? I went, well, about, I don't know how, how much later, I actually was watching the actual inauguration, and you know where my mouth was? <laughs> and I thought, my God, that wasn't so far from the truth. But everybody, when they see that opening visual, it gets a laugh, because I think it is, was our... It's cathartic. I saw that, and I was like, yeah, that's it. That's, that's the face. That's what we, we were all face. feeling, that was... and, and that's how we all looked. Can we be selfish here and say that... That, that change for our show, I think, is the one good thing that came out of this presidency, as it did add a, a new layer to the good fight. So I think if anyone's looking for a silver lining, they can find it in this show. What, what layer did they add to it? Did it add to the show, outside of that opening shot? Well, let's face it, it's called The Good Fight, and you see a woman, um, the, the main story is a woman who was at the top of her game and then whoop, suffers a precipitous fall, yet has to pick herself back up and fight the good fight. Now, I marched in the Women's March the day after the inauguration, and I was taking those steps thinking, are we seriously still fighting for these issues? The, the fight is not over. It's not over for women. Now, I'm not speaking for the kings. I don't think they would say the title is that it's still a woman's fight and that it's a feminist um, kind of title. But for me, for a, as a character, she is having to go back and fight for her life, for for work, for her identity, for She's an the things she she becomes exactly. Yeah. She suddenly is an underdog. In and many ways, it's kind of a microcosm for a lot of people in this country right now who are for the exactly. first time ever civically engaged it, exactly. and totally involved. The fight is far from over, and. Uh, I think what Justin meant was we have this rich terrain, this rich landscape of national life. I mean, we can't stop watching television these days. We watch daily press conferences. It's, as soon as we're done it's talking, become I'm going to this, CNN. <laughs> yeah, it's become this horrifying reality show. But the writers will get to write about characters living in this world because they're intelligent people going to work and living in the Trumposphere. And we, we've we already done some, some episodes that uh, refer to him or address the issue living in the age of Trump. We do one about censorship. We do another one about an alt-right troll, internet troll. Um, well, I think the writers are looking forward to writing about this. And so the show will, I think, be incredibly contemporary and feel. And it, it also, every every point of view doesn't come from the liberal perspective. There, you know, the, I think the kings really try to keep it even-handed and not have a skewed uh, liberal bend on everything. Obviously, there are care. You know, that's what's beautiful about having a character show with all of these rich characters. They all come from a different point of view, and you see that. And not, you know, and there isn't, you know, there's an ambiguous in between uh, between the fighting of. Uh, perspectives it's cool but it's getting tougher than ever to not be a little skewed at this point <laughs> yeah well, it, I'm, yeah. it really is but but that makes for good drama because if you have a conservative and a liberal viewpoint in the same room it's going to get pretty passionate i mean we did we did do an episode that dealt with censorship in the age of trump and and uh, michael boatman and delroy lindo they were playing a scene and they're, they're like full volume like at it arguing so, and that makes for good television, you know? If everybody's happy, it's not great TV. Yeah, and the lines are blurred now between what that liberal perspective and conservative perspective are. You have conservatives that aren't happy with Trump, and you have, you know, some that are still happy with Trump. But the underdog thing is really interesting. When you, you look at these three women, especially, 
What's so cool, especially with Diane and uh, Rose Leslie's character, Maya, who's at the beginning of her career, you know, Diane is now, an, she, ha she is an, uh, an unwilling underdog in, in the most extreme sense. And then you have this uh, um, Maya character, Rose Leslie, who wants to be an underdog. She, ha she comes from privilege and she just wants an even playing field as we start out. So it's a really nice kind of juxtaposition between these two women and you see how they play off of each other in a really, you know, uh, a different way that's not so clear cut. Not to stick to politics, but I'm just kind of curious, was Get Nasty, was that tagline before or, or after the election? I love it. I'm sure it's inspired. Oh, I, I think the nasty came, wasn't it last year Hillary Clinton yeah, made her a mock? Oh, no, he called her a nasty woman. Yeah, yeah. So nasty's been in the cultural vocabulary for quite some time, but it makes for a good kind of like, watch this show, get yeah. nasty. <laughs> Talk about the rest of the cast. You mentioned uh, Rose Leslie, Delroy Lindo. Justin, you're, you're part of the show as well. Uh, did you have any- Sarah Steele is in it, Erica Tezel, yeah. It's, it's like, we, we, we just have such unique and gifted, original and experienced actors on the show. And that to me was always the joy of being on it, was great writing. Great ensemble, and then all those guest actors. Guests that, on the Good Wife, and they're coming. The they're all coming back. Coming back, yeah. Matt it, Perry is back. John uh, Benjamin Hickey, Jane uh, Alexander, and Carrie Preston. Yeah. They're all back, so it's like a New York so repertory. Right in the second episode, and he's fantastic in that episode. Yeah, 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 yeah. yeah. Uh, unbelievable. So uh, you guys are on CBS All Access. You're not on, so you get to, you know, curse, right? I cursed several times. It was so liberating. <laughs> Are you a cursor in real life? Occasionally. <laughs> yes. It was nice to be able to do it on TV finally. Yeah, but I do it at two really very emotional moments. Well, one of which is alone in a room when I find out I've lost all my money, and then when I'm in I'm in an alone in a room with my estranged husband, and um, I'm also I break down and cry and say, "How can my life be so effing worthless?" I mean the. There is a lot to be said for those, those expletives. They really do make you feel like it's oh, an emotional release that you never get to do on network. So what, do you know what the decision was behind going with uh, CBS All Access and, and being able to use curse words rather than going with you know, CBS at 10 p.m.? Yeah, I mean, I think that, you know, CBS was launching this platform. Uh, and, you know, obviously they have, I think, uh, out of the networks, they have a viewership that could probably, you know, uh, launch it in a way that it needs to be launched, as in I think every network eventually is going to have to do this uh, within the next certainly five, uh, at the most, ten years. So I think that, uh, you know, as uh, the Kings told me, this was a, a chance to live within the Good Wife universe, but also kind of really fully flesh out the characters and their vision and not have the restraints of network, which are, you know, if we're honest, a little antiquated, especially when you're telling kind of adult stories. Will uh, Alicia be making a return? The, the, the word on that is no. Uh, that comes from the Kings and from Juliana. They, they, they all three of them felt it wouldn't quite work. And I also think Jules, having carried that show on her back brilliantly for seven years, deserves to either stay home or do something else with her life or attend to her hu husband and, and beautiful child. So n nowhere near in the future, that's for sure. How referential do you want to be to the, to the good wife through the, through the storylines of the good fight? Or is it going to be more of like a, a kind of a clean break? The exception of obviously your character is from there, but there are, I, I would, there's going to be a lot that is familiar in the pilot. You will see the David Lee character be, you know, the, the nasty person that he is, and um, Howard is coming. Will 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 be there, um, and uh, let's see. Well, Cush is, of course. I I the first thing that I said when I agreed to do the spin-off or it was talked about, I said to Kush, please come on board with me because I adore her. Um, you will see the world of the good wife because of Diane and, and who she is and, and she's, you know, the law firm is expanded, but it will be like, oh, there's Diane. She's, you know, the head of the law firm and there's all the guys surrounding her and there's her world. And then, you know, half, as I said, not even halfway through, the bottom drops out. So 
you don't have to be familiar with The Good Wife to just start watching The Good Fight. But there's enough, and certainly the look of it and the sound of it because of the writing. You go, oh my gosh, so nice to be back in that world of those, of those writers. And then of course you've got those court cases which are always so interesting, ethical issues which are discussed in such a fascinating way. So there, there'll be so much that, that was good about it. I think that's why we wanted to spin it off, was we wanted to continue everything that was good about it. Also the line between entertainment and politics now is so skewed. It's the same thing almost. So when you know, with the Good Wife in the Obama years, you know, it was kind of like uh, uh, ignorant bliss in a sense. And now you have people so plugged in to every story that it's almost like you know, it's a seamless transition to do the kind of topical cases mm -hmm. that they do. And we're finding so often that whether intentional or not, almost every story is suddenly having political resonance or significance, just either symbolically or intentionally on the part of the creators. Yeah, certainly everyone has an opinion, and I think that that's what's also juicy about watching it. I have this theory that because real life and, and the national landscape is like a bad reality show right. that people are going to watch right. scripted television. I have the same thing. To, to go for sanity. Yes. Where, oh, intelligent people, well spoken. Oh, and there they are in court and they're discussing these issues in an intelligent way. And, and yes, these an are mature adults. Yeah. And people will actually go to fiction. But there's an objectivity to, <laughs> strangely, an objectivity to a TV show. And because accountability. there's accountability. Yeah. We, we remember the good old days of truth and accountability. <laughs> And the lies don't affect the actual viewers of the show the way that it is. Crazy. I mean, Saturday Night Live, how, how do you even, it's like watching Saturday Night Live, right? In the, the real world? Is yeah. The, oh, yeah. yeah. Oh, yeah. I it's just pretty came. hard to, like, you know, send it up. It's already up. It's way up. And it's hard to turn it off, too, because it's so consistently That's outrageous. That's the problem. Not that not. is the problem, yeah. yeah. I'm, I'm curious how often you've been making that face that you made in the first step, first scene. I, I go home at night and of course I, I put on the news and I was never a morning news watcher. Never, because I don't like the sound of television when I get up, but now it's like morning Joe and what's happened next and you know, you can barely keep up. And so yes, funny. I'm always like. <laughs> I still find the moments with cable news though, as much as I have it on in the morning now, and I turn it on at night because I need to catch up. Like about 45 minutes, and I'm like, all right, brain's bleeding, gotta shut this off and maybe read a book or something. I think there's going to be. That's when like, I go to the good fight because I get the yes, rational. Yes, you'll thought. you'll find calm and an intelligent uh, kind of just a, an island of calm. Yeah, do tune in <laughs> for sanity. Let's uh, get some questions from the audience. Who has questions out right here, sir? Hi, thank you so much for coming. I had a chance to see the pilot Monday. It was fantastic, so great job. You've been so successful in both comedy and drama. Do you have a preference for either one? No. Well, oh, sorry. <laughs> <laughs> Go ahead. No, 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 it was pure joy, pure joy. I, I, you know, I love them both. I had a lot to learn as a dramatic actress because most of my career was comedy. And then I got offered The Good Wife. I was like, oh my lord, this is really like, there are no laughs here. And um, fortunately, I can go to the Big Bang Theory and get some big yucks over there and then come back. But it's, a, it's wonderful to do both, I must tell you. It is great to do both. But that said, comedy is very serious business. If you want to get a laugh, it's got to be really grounded in truth. And you have to be almost more fierce and more earnest as a comedian than you do as a dramatic actor. Jason, would you agree with that? Oh yeah, 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 for sure. I mean, I think they're the, they're almost the same thing, but there is the uh, reverse side of the coin where, I for me, my favorite type of dramatic when I watch uh, beautiful dramatic acting, there is a through line of comedy in there too. There is a re there is a, that's what connects it to everything else, and comedy is exactly what. I mean, what am I going to argue with her? No, <laughs> whatever she said, whatever she said, don't ask. Uh, next question. Hi there. Um, I know you've addressed this quite a lot, but I mean, you must be really proud of like how women have come to the fore. There were ro there weren't roles for women some years ago. I am. I am extremely proud. I'm of, extremely proud to be in my 60s and to be a working actress and to play such an intelligent woman who's my age. And as I said, as Justin said, no apologies. No, no. Paid my dues. Work hard. There's lots of women out there. There are no apologies. We're doing just fine. Fabulous. 
I think we have time for one more question. My question's for Christine. I know you had a start on Broadway, so I was just wondering, um, like, did you see much of a difference when you uh, transitioned into uh, film and television? And is there, like, maybe a chance that you maybe might come back to theater? I did most of my career was as a theater actress, and I certainly didn't start on Broadway. I started in regional theater and then off off Broadway and off Broadway. And by my 30s, I was doing Broadway. And in my 40s, I didn't do television until I was in my 40s. That was my first sitcom. So here I am doing, I'm doing television. But are there differences? There are wonderful differences. And I would say any actor, in this day and age, you want to be able to do everything. You want to do television, you want to do film, you want to do... It's, it's a wonderful play, playground. And any film actor or TV actor who waits too long to go back to the stage, it's going to scare you because that is a demanding mistress and it's wonderful to be on the stage. You, you have to use mu muscles that you don't have to use in front of a camera. So I say, if, if you're lucky enough, mix it all up and do as many and as much of everything as you can. What, did, you, had, did you just start auditioning for television when you started getting into it, or had you been auditioning for television while doing theater your whole career? You know, I would audition for pilots. I was never that typical girl that they cast in pilots, and it was usually the best friend or the wisecracking best friend. I was never like a romantic leading lady. Um, you were doing films, though. I was doing some film. I mean, Reversal yeah. of Fortune? Yeah, Reversal of Fortune came right after I did this Broadway show, The Real Thing, which was a big Broadway hit that I did in 1984. That she won the Tony for, right? That she won the Tony for? <laughs> But um, who directed Reversal of Fortune again? Who, which? Barbie Schroeder. Barbie Schroeder, right? Yeah. But yeah, I did some film and all. But yeah, I waited a long time to before doing television, and I I had auditioned for pilots and all. And then there was this one pilot, Sybil, and the Carsey Warner Company had been seeing my work in the theater and trying to get me to come to California to do um, a television show. And I always said, No, I'm raising my kids back east. I don't want to work in L.A. If you ever do a show in New York. It was always predicated on if there's a show in New York. And back then, they weren't doing shows in New York. Now they're doing tons of shows in New York. But especially sitcoms, to this day, they do most sitcoms in California. Anyway, there was this one sitcom called Sybil, and I read it, and it was by a man I'd never heard of named Chuck Lorre. <laughs> Who's that? Yeah. And there was something about this character. I thought, man, she is, she's very witty. She's very funny. And I took the leap. And I kept my kids in Connecticut and commuted. My husband was home. And those were three and a half years. But it, it changed my career dramatically because that was a big, that character was a breakout character. And I, and I won an Emmy for it and then got more film roles. And that started a whole other momentum to my career. And then it got you uh, in The Good Wife later on, and now with your... It did. I'm still on CBS. And, um, yeah, no complaints here. You shouldn't complain. The Good Fight is, is unbelievable. It's really great. I can't wait to watch more. Thanks so much for being here, you guys. Oh, thank you. The thank Good you Fight, for coming. Uh, premieres this month. When does it premiere? This Sunday at 8 o'clock. Oh, go ahead, Justin. Do it. No, no, no. Go. go. 8 o'clock on Network. You can tune in as you would watch The Good Wife on a Sunday night. But that said, it will also be streaming at 8 o'clock on Sunday, as will the second episode. So it's CBS um, All Access yeah. dot com backslash good fight is how you find how to get on it. But it's a streaming service. It's not cable. Okay? Yeah. Get it. Watch it. It's fantastic. Congratulations, you guys. Thank you so much for being here.